We all hope to be there one day. Once there, we wonder, what will we do? There are various opinions on how we get there. We wonder what it's like. We may already have family there. We have lots of questions about it. What is it really like? You know, I've been thinking a lot about boxes the last couple of days. And the reason why I've been thinking about these moving boxes is because of a couple of reasons. Number one, First of all, you may or may not know that Pastor Landon and Kelsey bought a house and they are moving and relocate a little closer to the church this coming up week or next, all right? And so the, he's been like gathering all kind of boxes in the office. And now, in addition to that, Pastor Joe and Laura, our new student pastor who are here today, and you'll meet them at the close of the service, they'll also been moving to our area. So there's kind of been a, shall we say, discussion over who gets the boxes in the office that are left over because they're trying to both get, you ever moved? Remember the last time you moved? Maybe you bought a new home. Maybe you changed jobs. Maybe you left for college. Maybe you finally moved out of your parents' house, bless God. You had to get some, remember everything you had to do, right? I mean, you had to pack everything up. You had to decide what to keep, what to throw away, what to give away, what to eBay, right? And then you had to find people that helped you move. You really had to figure out who your real friends were because if they're gonna help you move, they really like you, okay? And then once you got to the new place, you had to unpack you had to decide where everything goes. I mean, moving is really a paradox. I mean, we're excited about the new place, but we also kind of dread the stress of just moving and preparing and all the work that's necessary to, to move to the new place. And you know, if, if we're honest, that's how a lot of people think about, about heaven. They want to go there, they want to go to heaven. They just don't want to do what's necessary to prepare to go to a place called heaven. And what makes it really stressful is that we're not even sure when we're going to be moving, if you will, to heaven. And as a result, because it seems like it's so far away, for most of us, we, if we're not careful, we can get so caught up in today. And just life today, I, I'm just trying to get through today and, and, and this week and this month that we forget that Jesus taught us that we're to be packed up and ready to move at a moment's notice. Or to say it another way, we should always be looking and longing and living for heaven. You see, heaven should affect my life today. And now, if you haven't already done so, go ahead and open your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, now, if you do not have a hard copy of the Word of God, we have free Wi-Fi at both our campuses. Those of you up in the Allegheny County, up at our Highlands campus, uh, there's Wi-Fi up there as well. So excited about what God is doing up at our Highlands campus. Terry and I were super pumped last Sunday night to be up there with you guys and to see over 25 new members in our new members class just at our Highlands campus. We give God the glory for his work at our Highlands campus. Now, uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter is writing to some people who are suffering. He's writing to some early Christians who are really going through it. These people are being persecuted. They're being tortured. This is the time in history where Christians were being burned alive at the stake. 
This is the time in history when Christians were being fed to the lions. And they were wondering the same thing we wonder when we're suffering, when we're hurting. How long will it last? They're wondering when will this end? They're wondering, God, where are you? And to encourage the people, what Peter does is he writes them a letter and he reminds them of heaven. He reminds them of a place called heaven. He refers to it in this passage as the day of the Lord. Now, as always, I'm reading out of the 1984 New International Version of God's Word, 2 Peter chapter 3. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. Let's stop right there. That's why we call this 2 Peter. Okay, some of you are with me. All right. I have written both of them to you as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by waters. And by these waters, also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly man. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures for their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forevermore, amen. What is Peter basically saying? He's saying, number one on your handout, we should look beyond today to heaven. We should look beyond today. Maybe you're like the people here that he's writing to. Maybe you're really going through it. Maybe something's happening in your life emotionally. Maybe there's a relationship that's strained. Maybe there's something physically. Maybe you are hurting. Maybe you are suffering. Maybe there's something. You didn't bring it on yourself. You didn't cause it. It, whatever it is, just happened. And it's so easy to get so caught up in today to forget Peter's encouragement that there is a place called heaven one day. And he says in verse 1, I want to remind you. It's a common theme for Peter. He said in chapter 1 and verse 2, I want to remind you. He said in chapter 1 and verse 13, I want to refresh your memory. You know, here's something that I've been thinking about recently in my own life. I often need to be reminded more than I need to be informed. 
Uh, you know, listen, Peter says, I know it's hard right now. I know it's tough right now. I know it's not fair, but A, on your handout, what he says is scripture should stimulate us. Look what he says in verse one. Stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want to stir up your sincere mind. Why? Because everything I do, good or bad, starts as a thought. You ever thought about that? Everything I do, good or bad, starts as a thought. That's why the Bible tells me to guard my mind. That's why the Bible tells me to bring every thought captive. That's why Peter says here, I want to remind you, because again, often we need to be reminded more than we need to be informed. Have you ever thought about, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, the amount of sermons and Bible study lessons you have heard? I mean, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've been coming to church for any length of time, think about the amount of sermons and connect group lessons and Bible studies. And then if you have a daily devotional time as you should, a daily quiet time with God, think about all the information. Think about what you've already forgotten. Somebody said it this way. It's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that I worry about. It's the parts of the Bible that I do understand that concern me. He's saying that scripture should stimulate us to wholesome thinking that we should look beyond today to heaven and then be, look he says in verse two, scripture should remind us, remind us about heaven, remind us that Jesus is coming again. Look what he does in verse two. He links the prophets and apostles. He's basically saying that both the Old Testament and the New Testament are authoritative. He's basically saying both the Old Testament, the prophets, and the New Testament, the apostles, both teach this same truth that Jesus is coming again, that there is indeed a real place called heaven. You see, when it comes to truth, the prophets foreshadowed it, Christ exemplified it, and the apostles interpreted it. And we see in these first two verses, the written word of God, the Bible, the living word of God, Christ, and we see the spoken word of God through the apostles and prophets. Can I remind you today that this is the very word of God. It doesn't contain the word of God. It is the word of God. Man did not invent it. Man did not create it. Man did not fashion it. Man, Peter would say in verse 21 of the previous chapter, man didn't even write it. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's why we believe in what's called the plenary verbal inspiration of scripture, plenary, plenary, all, verbal, the very words. And because it is the written word of the Lord, because it is the word of God, it should stimulate us. It should excite me. When I think for a second that this holy book tells me about a place called heaven, when I think for a second that this book tells me that my sins can be forgiven. When I think that this very book, friends, tells me how to have peace and contentment and purpose for today, that is exciting. It is stimulating. It's something that I want to be reminded about because no matter what I'm going through, it reminds me that it will be worth it one day. And not only is it worth it one day, it's worth it right now because Jesus is coming. The day of the Lord is near. So Peter's writing to these people who are really struggling and he says, I wanna encourage you, be reminded, be stimulated, look for heaven. Look beyond the day and the pressure of raising kids and the pressure of trying to earn a living and the pressure and the worries of life. You might be discouraged today. You might be hurting. You might feel like you're stuck in a rut spiritually. You might feel like you're not growing spiritually. What you need to do, my dear friend, is not wallow in self-pity. What you need to do is not cry. It is not 
there. What you need to do is not moan or groan or complain. What is needed for you and I is to open the pages of this book and realize that the Lord may come this very day. Philippians 3 says it this way, forgetting what is behind and looking toward what's ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I look beyond today to heaven. We should look beyond today to heaven. And then Peter says number two, we should long for the day We will be in heaven. Uh, Paul said it this way in Philippians 1. I am torn between the two. I'm torn between being with Christ in heaven and being here with you. You ever been torn? You, You ever been torn between being two places at once? You're torn between I want to be with my family, but I got to go to work and earn a living and provide for them. You ever been torn between trying to be at two places at once? I'm I'm torn. I know in the morning I need to get up and go to church, but these blankets are so comfortable. And some of you right now are watching me because you couldn't get out of bed this morning. And I cannot remind you as great as technology is, And if you're traveling and if you're in a nursing home or you're in a hospital or you're outside our geographic area, I'm thankful you're tuned in. But understand, if you live within a reasonable driving distance of one of our campuses, the Bible is clear. We're to gather together corporately as believers. Peter says then, verse three, don't be surprised. In the last days, scoffers will come. What's he saying? People who are being fed to the lions, people that are being burned alive, here's what he says. It may get worse. Well, that'll bless you, won't it? He says it may get worse before it gets better, but it will get better. Uh, Look at, turn back to chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 19. Then the Lord knows Chapter 2, verse 9, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials. Isn't that a great verse? The Lord knows what you're going through. God cares. God is aware. God wants to help. He knows how to rescue godly men who are going through trials Peter saying, A, scoffers should not hinder us. He says in verse three, I want you to understand. Don't be surprised when people scoff and they make fun of the Bible. Don't be surprised when people scoff and they make fun of the exclusiveness of Jesus Christ. They say there's many ways to heaven. Don't be surprised when people scoff and they make fun of the church or Christians. Uh, Don't be surprised when people scoff and make fun of heaven and the day of the Lord. He says, number one, they are to be expected. Verse three, they will come. Hold your finger here and turn to 2 Timothy chapter three. 2 Timothy chapter three. Jude verse 18 says, in the last days, there will be scoffers who follow their own evil desires. Second Timothy chapter three and verse one. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Sounds a lot like today to me. So many people today have a form of godliness, but deny its power. How many times you see some politician who stands for policies that are antithetical to the teaching of Jesus Christ and his holy word at the end 
of his or her speech say something like, God bless America. What a shame it is that we live in a country that it's all of a sudden national news when our president has the courage to show up at the March for Life simply to on to defend the rights of everybody. What a shock that that is all of a sudden national news. You talk about having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Pete says, don't be surprised. It's gonna happen. But they shouldn't hinder us. What were these people saying in this day? They were saying, well, it's been 30 to 40 years since Jesus died. He said he's coming back. Where's he been? They were scoffing. They, they were mocking. And good old Peter says, number two, they're to be challenged. Why they're to be challenged? Verse five, they deliberately forget. How are they to be challenged? They're to be challenged by the Bible. They're to, we're to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 15. We're to balance truth and love. There's so many today that are so focused on love. You know, God is about love and, and, and we should accept everybody and we don't want to offend anybody. and We want to be tolerant that they never get around to the truth. Even though Jesus said the truth will set you free. The truth's not always easy. The truth sometimes hurts. Here's the truth. Peter says, verse 5, God created the heavens and the earth. Here's the truth today. Peter's saying the day of the Lord will come. Here's the truth today. Peter's saying there is a real place called heaven. And the only way to get there is through Jesus Christ. Christ. He's not one way among many. He's not the best way. He's the only way. So number three, these scoffers are to be answered. Now, how are we to answer them? He would say in 1 Peter 3, always be prepared to give an answer, the reason for the hope you have. And you say, well, I want to do that. I want to be able to defend my faith to that coworker who always scoffs and mocks me. I want to be able to defend my faith to that classmate or that university professor. How do I defend my faith? Well, look what Pete says. He says, first of all, we can answer from history. He takes them all the way back in verses 5 and 6 to creation and the flood. And then on your handout, we can answer from Scripture. Look, verse 5, by God's word. Verse 7, by the same Word And then Peter does the same thing that Jesus did when he was tempted. What did Jesus do when he was tempted by Satan? He quoted scripture. Note what Peter does in verse 8. He actually quotes Psalm 90 verse 4. He's quoting Psalm 90 verse 4. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. We can answer from the character of God. And then in verse nine, he gives us the reason for the apparent delay. Even when we're hurting, we all question God's timing like these people were. It's been 30 to 40 years, Jesus hadn't returned. We've got to trust the character of God. Where is God when I'm really going through it? Where is God when I hurt? Where is God when there's some terrible tragedy, people ask? The same place he's always been, on the throne, ruling and reigning over the affairs of men. Why doesn't he do something? Why doesn't he do something? He is. What's he doing? Verse 9, waiting. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, he's patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He's waiting for people to, re what a thought, God, the God of heaven could be waiting for you today. How do I answer 
How do I answer these scoffers, people that ridicule me? We answer through history, through the scripture, through the character of God. And then Peter says, we answer from the promise of Christ. Verse 10, the Lord will come. Matthew 24, Luke 12, be ready for the son of man will come in an hour you do not expect. John 14, Jesus, I will come back to take you to be with me. Scoffers should not hinder us, B, scoffers should motivate us. Peter's saying that when I'm persecuted, when I'm mocked, when I'm made fun of because of my beliefs, I should be thankful that I'm encountered worthy to suffer for his name. I should be motivated. Why in the world should I be motivated? Well, Peter's going to mention something in verse 7 that we don't hear a lot about today. Even a lot of churches, we don't hear a lot about it today. Because quite frankly, most pastors have wimped out and they won't talk about what Peter will talk about in verse seven. Look how he says it very clearly. By the same word, the present heavens and the earth are reserved for fire, being kept, here it is, for the day of judgment. Number one, we should be motivated because they remind us of the circle, that word coming Judgment, dear friend, judgment is coming. Now, do not misunderstand. As we studied last week, we studied last week, what are we gonna do in heaven? And we looked at seven things we're gonna do in heaven. And one of the things we studied is we will face judgment, but let me be clear and remind us, we don't face judgment in heaven to determine whether we get into heaven or not. See, most people confuse this. They think I die and then I stand before the Lord in judgment and then he decides who gets in and who doesn't get in. That's not what the Bible teaches, no. That's decided right now while we're alive. We decide our eternal destiny based on whether we receive Jesus Christ as our personal savior or we reject Christ as our savior. And judgment will come. And if I'm a believer, I'm judged to receive rewards, if any, I get in heaven. And if I'm an unbeliever, I'm judged to determine the Degree of punishment I'm going to get in hell. Romans 14, all of us will give an account of himself to God. So 1 John 4, I should have confidence on the day of judgment. If I'm a believer, 2 Corinthians 5 reminds me that I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and will receive rewards called crowns for how I live my life, how obedient I was after I received Christ as my Savior. And one day I will lay those rewards, those crowns at his feet. Now, if I'm an unbeliever, what's gonna happen? Turn to Revelation 20, Revelation 20 and verse 11. Unbelievers appear in what's called in front of the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, 11, then I saw a great white throne. Him who was seated on it, earth and sky, fled from his presence. There was no place for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead. Now, let's stop right there. I've been getting a lot of questions. On Wednesday night, we're doing this study, questions about heaven. One of the questions I've received repeatedly is, is it right for a Christian to be cremated? After a believer dies, is it okay if that believer's wishes is for them to be cremated? Cremated. Some people say, no, that's, that, uh, that's not right. They shouldn't do that. Other people say, well, there, there, uh, there, there's nothing wrong with that. What's the answer? You got to come Wednesday night to find out the answer. But there's a clue given here in this passage. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and each person was judged according to what he has done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he's thrown into the lake of fire. You see, 
For unbelievers, the books will be open. God shows them that he had a place for them, but they rejected it, and they're judged at the great white throne judgment to determine the degree of their punishment in hell. Scoffers should not hinder us. They should motivate us because they remind us of the coming judgment. Number two, because they remind us of the Lord's promise. Look what he says in verse nine. He's not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repent it. See, some people try to think that, you know, God's up in heaven and he says, I'll take you, I'll take you, I'll take you, I'll take you, the rest of you are out of luck. That's not what the Bible teaches. Very clearly, he doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to come Two, repentance, the verse on the back side of your handout, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants, circle this, all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Because we've come to the knowledge of truth, because we've come to the place of repentance, because we know, verse 10, the day of the Lord will Come, Peter gets to the main point, his main point in verse 11, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Since you've received, you've come to the knowledge of truth, since you know there's a place called heaven waiting for you, since you have repented of your sins, since you know, verse 10, the day of the Lord will come, what kind of people ought ought we to be. You ought to live holy and godly lives. You see, number three, we should live like we will be in heaven one day. We should live like we should be in heaven one day. Look at the verse on your handout. And now, dear children, continue in him. In other words, you're saved, you're a believer, you've settled it once for all, continue in him. You can't grow in your faith and you can't grow in God or live for God until you know God. You continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. What is he saying? A, People should not miss heaven because of us. He's saying, I don't want to be a barrier. I don't want to be a barrier because of my attitude, because of my actions. We need to be Christ's hand extended. We are his hands, his feet, his mouth. We are the only Jesus some will ever see. So tomorrow when you get up and you go to work, or you go to practice, or you go to class, when you interact with people, people should not miss heaven because of us. By the way, we conduct ourselves when we're doing a business deal. By our attitude, by our actions, by the words we say, we should live like we will be in heaven one day and people should not miss heaven because of us. When we're sitting at the stands watching the ball game, people, here's where it's really hard. When we're driving on Interstate 81, people should not miss heaven because of us. Note God's patience, verse nine. He says in verse nine, he is patient. Verse 15, the Lord's patience means salvation. Think about it. We see it all through the Bible, right? Before God destroyed the earth with a flood, he told Noah, build the ark. He gave the people 120 years to repent. God was patient with Nineveh and sent the prophet Jonah to them, even though he didn't even want to go. God was even patient with Sodom and Gomorrah until finally his patience ran out. He's been patient for 2,000 years. You see, number one, God's patience gives us the opportunity to work. And right now, he is waiting on you and I to get to work. Friends, my heart has been broken again when I think of the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people in our community that are unchurched, are de-churched. Someone or something happened. And you and I know, as you drove here today, and you, you know your neighbors, 
some of your family members, and they're not in church. My heart is broken when I think there's coming judgment. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? Listen, if we really actually believe what this book teaches about heaven, if we actually believe what this book says, that Jesus is coming again, that judgment will come, if we actually believe that your neighbors and mine, the people we interact with every day, will actually spend a Christless eternity in hell, if we actually believe it, we can't afford to be lazy. We can't afford to get sidetracked, arguing about trivial issues and our preferences. We must keep the main thing, the main thing, and the main thing is the gospel. We must have the gospel above all. We can't afford to coast. We can't afford to get comfortable. No, God's patience gives us the opportunity to work. And then number two, God's patience gives us the opportunity to understand the future. Look what he says very clearly. There's no uncertainty about the fulfillment of Jesus' promise. He says on your handout, Jesus will return. Verse 10, the day of the Lord will come. It's emphatic. It's certain. There's no doubt about it. Now, he says, number one, it'll be unexpected. It'll be like a thief. Number two, it'll be catastrophic. Look at verse 10. The heavens will disappear with a roar. And the elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Verse 12, you look forward to the day of God. That's what we've been talking about. And speed, it's coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. You see, the day of the Lord should inspire holy living. Verse 12, what kind, verse 11, what kind of people... Ought you to be, verse 14, so then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, since you know you're going to a place called heaven, since you know it's gonna happen, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. You see, as believers, we can, what a thought, verse 12, speed his coming. How do we do that? By our praying, by our giving, by our working, by our witnessing, we lead others to repentance. As Christians, verse 14, we should do all we can to have a spotless character, a blameless reputation. Again, people should not miss heaven. But, man, I know that's heavy. What a thought. Because of my attitude, because of my actions, we can either speed his coming or we can cause people to miss heaven. Why do people reject the gospel anyway? Why do people leave a church? Yes, I know it's disobedience and I know the Bible talks about how their hearts are hard and, and, and pride, but just practically speaking, practically speaking, why do people reject God's offer of salvation? Why, why in the world do people you know, I used to be in church. Why do people, why do people do that? You know why? Number one reason, hands down. Because of people. People who claim to be Christians, but as we read earlier in 2 Timothy 3, have a form of godliness, but deny its power. He's saying people should not miss heaven because of us. God's patience gives us the opportunity to work. God's patience gives us the opportunity to understand the future. Jesus will return, and he will actually return twice. 1 Thessalonians 4, he will return in that great event called the rapture, which we who are alive at that time will be caught up together, will be raptured up together to meet the Lord in the air. Then what's next? Seven years of tribulation. What happens at the end of them? The battle of Armageddon. Jesus returns and rules and reigns for a thousand years called the millennium. What happens at the end of that? A new heaven and a new earth, the day of the Lord. You see, God's patience gives us the opportunity to understand Jesus will return and then look at Revelation chapter 21. 
he will create a new heaven and new earth. Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. Isaiah 65 promises this. We see it, Peter's talking about it. Remember, as we've been in this study, we've learned that heaven is a real place, but there is a present heaven and there is a future heaven. There is a present heaven. Your relatives that knew Jesus who have passed on are there. This is not purgatory. It's not soul sleep. It's not some intermediate state. It's not that the present heaven isn't good enough. No, absent from the body, present with the Lord. When we die as a believer, we go to heaven to be with Jesus. But one day, heaven and hell will move. Heaven and hell will be relocated. We'd read earlier, Revelation 20, where, uh, where he talks about in verse 14, death and Hades, hell, are thrown into the lake of fire. The ultimate end for non-believers is the lake of fire. The ultimate end for believers after the rapture, after the tribulation, after the battle of Armageddon, after the millennium, at the very end is a new heaven on a renewed Earth, that's what the Bible talks about. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And because of that, I should live today like I will be in heaven one day and no one should miss heaven because of me and B, Satan should not detour us. Look what he says in verses 15 through 18. Satan should detour us, number one, from sharing Christ with others. He shouldn't detour us, number two, from the scriptures. In verse 16, he talks about Paul's letters being scriptures. He shouldn't detour us, number three, from spiritual growth. He says, verse 17, therefore, in other words, because you know you're going to heaven one day, because you know that you will be with Jesus, because you know The day of the Lord is coming because you know there is a real, literal place called heaven. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, again, sometimes we don't need new information. We just need to be reminded of what we already know. Since you already know this, since you know you're going to be in heaven one day, just kick back and relax for the rest of your time on earth. That's not what he says, right? He says, be on your guard. Why? So that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position. No, but you, you grow. You grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, Spiritual growth is not subjective. It's not merely an experience or an emotion. It's related to to knowledge. I can't grow in God or live for God until I know God. There are some things you should know as a Christian. And he says in verse 18, that verb grow has the idea of continuous action. In other words, I never arrive spiritually. I, I must be continually growing. In growing in what? A whole bunch of random biblical facts so I can impress my coworkers or family? No, 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 no. I grow, look what he says it, in grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter's saying, listen, I know it's hard right now. Peter's saying, it might even get worse before it gets better. But the day of the Lord will come. One day, you're gonna be in heaven. Maybe today. Maybe a hundred years from now. But one day, if you know Christ, he's writing to people that knew Christ, you're gonna be in heaven. So look beyond today. Don't get just so caught up with the day and trying to get through today that you forget that you're gonna be in heaven. We should actually long for the day that we're in heaven. I want a difference. We should live like we will be in heaven one day. What if we actually did it? How?
how different would your workplace be? Would your family be? Would your school be? How different would your life be and my life be if we actually lived like we would be in heaven one day? But I don't want anybody to miss heaven because of me. And I don't want Satan to detour me. So here's the question, number one. Do you know for sure you will be in heaven one day? I didn't ask you if you're pretty sure you're going to heaven. I didn't ask you if you're... 99% 99% sure. I didn't ask you if you think you're going to heaven or if you hope you go to heaven. Do you know for sure you're going to be in heaven one day? Do you know God? Do you have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ? Have you nailed it down once and for all that you know that you know that you know? Listen, friends, if not, today is your day. Today is the day of salvation You just call out to him and say, God, I need you. God, come into my heart, my life. I repent of my sin. I want to follow you from now on. I believe you died, you were buried, you rose from the dead for me. I received Jesus as my Savior. Now, for those of us that have done that, once we've settled that, and once we know it, here's what Pete says to us. Number two, heaven should affect my life today. Heaven should affect my life today. I should be looking and longing and living for heaven. 